Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala ekmelil enbiya'i vel mursalin. Seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve ashabihi ve khulafaihi ila yevmid din. Welcome to the third in this uh, series of lectures at the uh, Cambridge Muslim College to the members of the uh, Cambridge New Muslim Group. Uh, broadcast also uh, live via the uh, internet. And uh, this time we'll be talking about the third of the four Khulafa Rashidun, the third of the four rightly guided Khalifas or Caliphs of Islam, which is Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan radiallahu an. We've already looked at some of the lessons that are beginning to emerge from our survey of these th four giants, uh, basing ourselves on the principle of the Chahariyar uh, enunciated by uh, Imam Shamsuddin Sivasi in his book on the four Khulafa. And we've uh, noted that each of them represents, uh, as it were, a particular uh, dimension or shaft of light from the prophetic diamond. Each of them is very characteristic, very different as an individual, and we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala values ikhtilaf, human difference, that he has created us as different forms. And one of the most beautiful things that you can learn from uh, studying the lives of the Sahaba is the extraordinary diversity of the uh, rainbow family of Islam and how Islam brings out rather than suppresses the distinctiveness of the personalities of uh, these extraordinary men and women. Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu an, as we saw the truthful, the believer, the only one to have entered Islam without any hesitation at all and the one who accepted as Siddiq the story of the Mi'raj as soon as he heard of it. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an, al faruq the one who differentiated absolutely rigorously between truth and falsehood. And Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu an, who is the subject of the lecture this evening, who we will see represents a different type of human perfection, quite different from his predecessors, but a form of perfection nonetheless. And as we'll see as the dramatic story unfolds, that certain things that continue to afflict and divide the Ummah today start to germinate in the uh, second half of his uh, distinguished Khilafa, radiallahu an wa arda. Sayyidina Uthman's name, Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, ibn Abil As, ibn Umayy, ibn Abshams, ibn Abdi Manaf. He's born five uh, years after the birth of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which was the year of the elephant. And he's from uh, one of the leading families of Mecca, one of the uh, noble lines of the tribe of Quraysh. Uh, his mother was Arwa bint uh, Khurais, who was uh, a relative of the Holy Prophet wasallam, also an aristocrat of Quraysh. Her mother was a woman called Umm Hakim bint Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim. So his mother was, her, her, his grandmother was the twin sister of the Holy Prophet's father. So there was a, a relationship through Sayyidina Uthman's uh, mother. He converts early in Islam uh, and is converted by Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu an during the time of the secret da'wah and for uh, the rest of Abu Bakr's life there's a particular closeness uh, between the two because it was Abu Bakr who uh, introduced him to Islam. In fact, uh, the historians record that Sayyidina Uthman was the fourth male adult convert to Islam. Uh, when he converts, of course, because he's a, a big shot, significant individual in the city of Mecca, this generates a good deal of rage and opposition. And his uncle, Al-Hakam, Ibn Abil As, uh, physically grabs hold of him, shakes him, and he ties him up, grabs a piece of rope and just trusses him up, throws him down and says, do you want to leave the religion of your ancestors for this new thing that hardly anybody is following that's just been invented? By Allah, I will not leave you alone until you give this up. But Uthman says, Wallahi ma taraktu ma ana fihi abada. By Allah, I will not abandon this ever. And is absolute. And when he sees his determination, uh, Al Hakam sees that this is uh, futile to try and uh, bully him out of Islam, and he uh, lets him go. 
But this is quite characteristic of, of Othman. He doesn't fight back, he doesn't uh, raise his hands in violence, uh, but he is absolutely determined, and we'll see that this becomes a characteristic of his way uh, right up to uh, his last days. It's uh, a, a sohba, a companionship with the Holy Prophet وسلم, that is full of distinction in every way. Uh, so he has a number of titles. One of them is Dul Hijratain, the one who migrated twice, because he was the first to migrate to Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, indeed the Holy Prophet وسلم, when he saw him off with uh, Ruqayya, who was the Prophet's daughter, who was um, Othman's wife, the Holy Prophet prayed for him and said, May Allah be with the two of them. Uthman is the first to have migrated with his wife since the time of Lut. And this ma'iyah, uh, this withness that the Holy Prophet والسلام, prays for becomes characteristic of Uthman in his ibadah. He is a man of ma'iyah, a man of withness, closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know quite a bit about what he looked like. He was a, a patrician figure, very, very good looking. Uh, he was uh, uh, reasonably tall. He, uh, was, he had a full beard, a pale complexion, and was famous for um, being physically very impressive. And one of the Sahaba said, رَأَيْتُ أُثْمَرِ بِنْ عَفَانٍ وَمَا رَأَيْتُ رَجُلًا وَلَا مْرَأَةً أَجْمَلَ مِنْهُ أَبَدًا I saw uh, Uthman bin Affan, and never in my life have I seen a man or a woman who was more beautiful than him in, in, in his face. And this is uh, a little story from Osama bin Zaid, uh, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent him once to Uthman's house with a plate of food. And he says, I went in. وَإِذَا بِرُقَيَّةً رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا جَالِسَةً And there was Ruqayya, may Allah be pleased with her, sitting. Osama is little at this time. فَشَرَعْتُ أَنظُرُ إِلَى وَجْهِ رُقَيَّةً تَارَةً وَإِلَى وَجْهِ Uthman And then I started to look first at Ruqayya, at her face, and then at the face of, of Uthman. And when I returned, the messenger asked, Have you ever seen a couple more beautiful than they? And I said, لا يا رسول الله No, O Messenger of, of, of Allah. Uh, and a number of interesting comparisons are made by the Holy Prophet himself between Hazrat Osman and uh, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, which is something that we're going to need to think about. Um, there's a narration from Aisha, radiallahu anha, when the Holy Prophet وسلم, gave his daughter Umm Kulthum in marriage, he said to her, your husband is of all men the one who most re resembles your grandfather Ibrahim and your father Muhammad. That's a major thing for him to be saying. Of all men, he is the one who most resembles Ibrahim and your father, uh, Muhammad. And there's actually a raft of other hadiths in which uh, the Holy Prophet وسلم, says that he found a resemblance between Uthman and uh, Ibrahim. Uh, other hadiths, there's a lot of hadiths about the manaqib, the virtues of Sayyidina Uthman. The, the Holy Prophet loved him very much and was very taken with uh, the, the depth and the stature of his spirituality. So he said that of all of my Sahaba, the one who most resembles me in khuluq, in traits of character, is Uthman ibn Affan. Uh, that's all very well, but what was the specific content of this? Uh, what kind of person was he, in fact? Uh, well, we know that he was famous for his haya, famous for his... Uh, his humility, his modesty, his shyness, which is uh, a fundamental quality, and this is also a prophetic quality. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أشد حياء من البكر في خدرها. The Holy Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام was more shy than a virgin in her tent, and this is the opposite of the kind of pharaonic glare. This is the prophetic shyness and, and humility that is actually the fulfilment of human dignity and not a sign of weakness. Uh, it's the sign of a complete overwhelming of the nafs by the ruh, of the ego by the spirit. And Sayyidina Uthman was famous uh, for being hayi, for having this, this quality of, of haya. And this seems to be the particular form of correspondence between him and his relative, uh, the Holy Prophet, that is being referred to. So, for instance, Anil Hassan, قال 
رأيت عثمان نائما في المسجد في ملحفة ليس حوله أحد وهو أمير المؤمنين just to show the, the level of his humility how he really didn't care about uh, dunya despite being from uh, 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 a wealthy family of, of grandees he said I once saw Uthman just sleeping in the mosque uh, with uh, a blanket over him nobody around him and at that time he was already Amir al-Mu'minin he was commander of the faithful and his third khalifa so by this time his empire stretches from Tunis to the gates of China he's one of the most powerful men in the world but he's just taking his siesta in the mosque which was actually a frequent custom of his um, after the Zohar prayer he would often just lie down in the masjid and go to sleep taking his qaylula and he didn't care exactly where he slept in the mosque and often he would sleep on the stones because most of the ground of the mosque of the Holy Prophet was actually made up of pebbles and he would just lie on, on, on those which would leave a mark on him but he paid no attention um, he also dis managed to keep up this extraordinary balance that is a feature of many of the great Sahaba particularly the wealthy amongst them that even though they were rich, independent, noblemen they paid no attention to any of that so for instance uh, uh, narrative from Shurahfil bin Muslim <coughs> in Uthman كان يطعم الناس تعام الإمارة Hazrat Uthman used to feed people with the Amir's food the stuff that was officially his وَيَدْخَلُوا بَيْتَهُ فَيَأْكُلُوا الْخَلَّ وَالزَّيْتِ and then he would go to his own house and eat um, vinegar and oil something cheap that was all he cared about he wasn't interested in banquets and he used to ride around Medina, Medina on a mule mules are not very uh, prestigious but they're tough and you, he also used to ride his servant behind him riding about the city on this mule known for being soft-hearted and in this respect I guess quite similar to Abu Bakr uh, he was known to weep frequently at, at the graves uh, until his beard was wet um, and not really caring about his clothes so one of the Sahaba said uh, during his khilafa ra'aytu Uthman bin Affan yawm al-jumu'ati 'ala al-minbar 'alayhi izarun 'adaniyyin ghaliz thamanahu arba'atu dirahim aw khamsatu dirahim wa ritatun kufiyyatin mumashshaqa i saw him uh, on the minbar on the friday and he was wearing a waist wrapper which was uh, made of thick rough uh, linen from Adan worth about four or five silver coins in other words a really rough cheap pauper's garment and his upper garment um, was uh, patched uh, another part of this was his generosity and he's remembered for this as well and this again is one of the ways in which we can say that he has this particular mushabaha or resemblance to the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam for whom generosity was really a way of life, an ancient aristocratic virtue, to give and to give and to give. وَلَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أَجْوَدُ بِالْخَيْرِ مِنَ الْرِيحِ الْمُرْسَلَةِ One of the Sahaba said, the Holy Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was quicker and more generous in giving than the wind let loose. The wind which has no boundaries and just goes where it will. And this was the Prophet's nature, that no gold or silver coin would spend the night in his house. Sayyidina Uthman was similar and was uh, absolutely celebrated for his, his generosity. Um, uh, there are two particular moments in which this generosity makes a critical difference during the seerah. And these are the moments where Uthman buys the well of Ruma shortly after the hijrah so that the Muslims can have their own well. Uh, and also when he prepares um, through spending vast sums uh, the Jaish al-Usra which is for the Tabuk expedition which was a necessary expedition to ward off Byzantine incursions and uh, was uh, extraordinarily expensive and so we have a hadith in which for instance Ishtara Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an min Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-jannata marratayn Uthman bought paradise twice from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Hayna hafira bi'ra Ruma when he had the well of Ruma dug wa hayna jahaza jaysh al-usra and when he prepared the army of difficulty 
and uh, the Tabuk expedition was announced by the Prophet والسلام, on the minbar. Hatha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala jayshi al-usra faqala Uthman ala mi'ati ba'irin bi'ahlasiha wa aqtabiha. So the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is urging the Sahaba to give and to contribute to this army of difficulty. And Uthman gets up and offers a hundred uh, camels with their uh, saddles and with the uh, equipment necessary for a cavalryman to accompany the army. قال ثم حث فقال عثمان على مئة أخرى بأحلاسها and Uthman gets up again and says another hundred with their uh, uh, equipment. قال ثم حث فقام عثمان and then he did it again again Uthman gets up he can't restrain himself. على مئة أخرى بأحلاسها وقتابها another hundred with their saddles and with their equipment. فرأيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول ما على عثمان ما عمل بعد هذا. And then the narrator said, I saw the Holy Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم moving his hand and saying, uh, this is enough for Uthman. He has uh, whatever work he does after this will be, as it were, supererogatory, um, uh, additional, because this is what will um, purchase paradise for him. And indeed, he equips a thousand camels. And he uh, gives the Holy Prophet uh, a, a, a bag of a thousand gold coins from his wealth. And as a result, the army is uh, successfully equipped. رأى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عثمان بن عفان يوم جيش العصرة جائيا وذاهبا. The Holy Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم saw Uthman ibn Affan on the day of the army of difficulty coming and going. فقال اللهم اغفر لي عثمان ما أقبل وأدبر وما أخفى وما أعلن وما أسر وما أجهر. And he makes this mighty prayer for Uthman and he says, Oh Allah, forgive Uthman as he comes and as he goes. And as he conceals things and as he announces things, uh, and as he keeps things in his heart and as he speaks of things. Uh, and he participates in many of the expeditions. Uh, and he participates in the, the, the two final hajjis of Islam, including the Hajj al Wida. And he is also known for having a tremendous personal presence. He's one of those people who a room will kind of be hushed when he entered it. He was a man of tremendous uh, stature. Uh, so there's a famous hadith in Bukhari and, and Muslim narrated by Aisha, radiallahu anha, that when Uthman entered, the Holy Prophet would gather his robes around him. You know how sometimes uh, when somebody significant comes in, you make sure that you're together. And he would say, should I not feel modest in the presence of the one in whose presence the angels feel modest? Uh, and this is part of his haya, perhaps his most famous of all of his virtues. And this is really the virtue of Islam itself. In the famous hadith, Kulli deenin khuluq wa khuluqul islam in haya. Every religion has a particular trait, a particular characteristic. The characteristic of Islam is modesty, humility, shyness. Uh, and uh, so we find this hadith. إن كان لا يكون في البيت the prophet is describing Uthman رضي الله عنه والباب عليه مغلق he could be in his house and the doors could be locked فما يضع عنه الثوب ليفيض عليه الماء and when he took off his clothes in order to pour the water over himself يمنعه الحياء من أن يقيم الصلبة so shy was he even though there's nobody around that he would be bending over rather than standing up straight this is his way of praising the the modesty the حياء of of Hazrat Uthman وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عثمان أحيا أمتي وأكرمها Uthman is of all the people of my Ummah the one with most haya and most karam that is to say the one that with, with most modesty and shyness and the one with the greatest generosity and these are really uh, beautiful aristocratic Islamic qualities so in all of these hadith we find the highest praise being accorded to uh, Hazrat Uthman. Ashaddu ummati hayaan Uthman ibn Affan. We hear it in khutbah sometimes, whether for uh, khulafa 
the Jihad Yara being mentioned, that the strongest of members of my Ummah in Hayat was uh, Othman. He is uh, given the good news of paradise in his uh, lifetime, partly through these, these reports of the Jaysh al-Usra. So he is one of the Ashra Mubashara, one of the ten who are given the good news of paradise while they lived. Another of his virtues uh, is that he had a particular relationship to the Qur'an and when we look at the history of sanctity in Islam we very typically find that there's a particular relationship to Allah's book. That's not surprising. Allah's book is Kalamullah al-Qadim, it is the uncreated speech of the Divine. When it is within us, when we recite it, we are not partaking of just another thing in dunya, we are as it were resonating with the words of the infinite that is at the heart of our worship and the heart of the religion and so the great awliya of this ummah have always had a particular close intimate relationship with with Allah's book and Hazrat Uthman was certainly uh, one of them and he has of course the famous story which we'll deal with uh, in a few minutes when he is the one who ensures the protection and the preservation of the Quranic text but he's also one of the only two Khalifas in the whole history of Islam to have memorized the entire text, one of the two Hafiz. <coughs> Uthman bin Affan is the first, and Al Ma'mun, one of the Abbasid caliphs, was, was the other. So we mentioned one of his titles, Thul Hijratain, the man of the two, uh, two migrations. But he has others as well. Uh, Al Musalli ila al Qiblatain is one of them. He was the, one of the companions who prayed to the two Qiblas. Jerusalem, and then the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah was re revealed, and he prayed towards uh, Baytullah al-Haram in Mecca. But he has another name as well, which is perhaps better known, which is Dhul Nurayn, the man of the two lights. There's different opinions on exactly what this means. Uh, the most common one is that it's referring to the fact that he married two of the daughters of the Holy Prophet وسلم, so he's called the man of the two lights first Ruqayya whom he married before Islam and uh, she died it seems that she had um, malaria and uh, died during the Battle of Badr and the Holy Prophet وسلم, excused him from attending with the army because he was nursing his dying wife and indeed um, when he was burying her during the burial, the news came of the, the, the victory at, at Badr. Uh, and he was strongly attached to her and the Holy Prophet, والسلام, partly because of his strong personal affinity with Uthman, um, gave him another of his uh, daughters uh, to marry. Um, Ruqayya is the mother of, of Abdullah uh, and this becomes his kunya. Uh, his patronymic name, so it's Abu Abdullah, his, uh, his informal name. Uh, some people looking at this name, Dhul Nurain, uh, the man of the two lights, <coughs> say that this was actually a title given to him not by the Holy Prophet, والسلام, but by Hazrat Ali, who again had a, a, a close personal relationship to him. But there's another tradition that says it's not because of the two wives, it's because um, in paradise the Holy Prophet predicted that he would always have two, wives, two, two lights with him, which he compared to um, bolts of lightning, which would be a particular way of indicating his, his um, high standing in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu alam, but in any case, this is his great title in Islam, his Dhul Nurain, the man of two lights. So much was the love that the Prophet ﷺ felt for Uthman that not only did he marry him to two of his daughters, uh, Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum. Umm Kulthum uh, also um, predeceases, dies before her father. This is part of the, if you might, you might say, the tragic dimension of the Holy Prophet's uh, life that he, he suffers a lot of bereavement. Only one of his children, Fatima, outlives him. Not an easy thing for a parent to, to bury his own children. Uh, Ruqayya dies, uh, Umm Kulthum dies a year before, uh, before her father. But we even find a hadith, if I had a third unmarried daughter, I would marry her to Uthman. And another hadith, if I had 40 daughters, hmm, and they died one after the other, I would still continue to marry them to, to Uthman. 
And again, all of these, and it's a huge amount of material that we have, confirms that there's a special relationship uh, between the two men. Um, another important facet of his diamond-like personality is his uh, strong attachment to devotion. He is one of the, the Nusak, the Obad, amongst the Sahaba. And here again we find his particular relationship with Allah's book. So, um, in the books of Tafsir, where you see the worshippers, the Obad, mentioned, very often you'll find that the Sahaba, commenting on these verses, <coughs> will say, uh, Othman is one of the people, or the person, that this particular verse refers to. So, to take one example, Aman huwa qanitun ana al-layli sajidan wa qa'iman يَحْذَرُ الْآخِرَةَ وَيَرْجُ رَحْمَةَ رَبِّهِ Is he who is submissive in the watches of the night, prostrate and standing, fearful of the afterlife and hoping for his Lord's mercy? Ibn Omar says, Who are Uthman ibn Affan? This is Uthman ibn Affan, famous for his night prayers. And again, uh, another verse, أَلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ ثُمَّ اتَّقَوْ وَآمَنُوا ثُمَّ اتَّقَوْ وَأَحْسَنُوا وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Those who have iman and do good works and then fear Allah and then uh, believe and fear Allah and act with ihsan, excellence, the highest spiritual de degree. وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah loves the people of ihsan. Ihsan is the highest degree and famously in the hadith and nawafil <coughs> that Allah loves uh, the one who is at this highest degree of, um, and uh, he sees uh, and he hears and he walks and he uh, smites by me. It's a famous uh, hadith of, uh, of the Nawafil. And uh, Sayyidina Uthman is clearly being identified with this high degree of, of, of Ihsan. Because in the books of Tafsir you find uh, Hazrat Ali saying Uthmanun minhum, Uthman is one of these people. Allahu yuhibbul muhsineen, Allah loves the people of Ihsan, Uthman is one of them. وَكَانَ عُثْمَانُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ يَصُومُ الدَّهَى وَيَقُومُ اللَّيْلَ إِلَى هَجْعَةٍ إِلَّا هَجْعَةٍ مِنْ أَوَّلِهِ They said that Uthman used to fast day after day after day. And he would stand all night in prayer, except for a light sleep which he would take at the beginning of each night. Once uh, he was watched in the mosque in Medina after the, the, the Aisha prayer, one of the Sahaba <coughs> noticed him in a corner of the mosque and kept watching him and noted that in the one prayer he completed the entire Qur'an. <coughs> and there are very few of the Sahaba of whom this is re reported <coughs> because it takes about eight hours, even if you recite it pretty fast, to recite the whole Qur'an. Um, and he would do this in, in two rakahs. Uh, and indeed, at the tragic end of his life, when his house is surrounded by the rebels, <coughs> his wife, Layla, uh, leans out. And she says, إِن تَقْتُلُوهُ أَتَتْرُكُوهُ فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ يُحِي اللَّيْلَ كُلَّهُ فِي رَكْعَةٍ يَجْمَعُ فِيهَا الْقُرْآنِ Whether you kill my husband or not, he is still the man used to give life to the whole night by reciting the whole Qur'an in a single raka. She was saying, you're kind of rabble. Here is the man who would spend the entire night um, with the Qur'an. He's known for transmitting hadith. It's 146 hadith narrated on his authority. Also well known for his fiqh and for his fatwa. So Ibn Sirin uh, would say, Uthmanu afqahu nasi fi manasik al-hajj thumma ibn Omar. Um, concerning the rituals and the rules of the Hajj, Uthman was, of all of the people, the most learned, the one who was the most fiqh, uh, followed by Ibn Omar. So we have this extraordinary closeness and distinction uh, between the Prophet والسلام, and Sayyidina uh, Uthman. And this kind of continues in a new way uh, in after uh, Abu Bakr becomes Khalifa. Because, as we mentioned, there's already a close friendship and a relationship between the two men because there's always a certain softness that links somebody to the person uh, who he took shahada with. 
in some mysterious way, there's a spiritual bond. And this is certainly something that unites uh, Sayyidina, Omar, uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and uh, Hazrat Osman. Uh, and in fact, uh, as we saw in the first of these lectures, the second person to pledge allegiance to, uh, to Abu Bakr is actually uh, Osman. And he would, as it were, mind the fort in Medina during the Ridda Wars and played a very significant consultative uh, role. During the uh, rule of Omar, he was the first person to pledge uh, allegiance to the new Amir al muminin And again, he, he uh, plays a vital role as his close counsellor. And a number of the important early fatwas in Islam that has huge knock-on effects for the populations were uh, attributed to Osman. So, for instance, what to do with all of these conquered lands? Do we just dish them out to the conquerors? Can the Sahaba take large chunks of Egypt and Tunis and Syria or wherever? Osman's view was that they should be left in the hands of their existing owners. It doesn't matter if they're Christians or Jews, whatever, you leave them in possession of their lands. And that was the ruling that was what was practiced. Um, the only exception being absentee landlords, so Greek um, expatriate barons who were running big estates in Egypt, who'd gone back to Constantinople. Those lands could be expropriated by the treasury and uh, dished out to uh, pensioners of, of the army, but not otherwise. And that was uh, the kind of ruling that uh, made uh, Hazrat Osman's councils vitally important during the, the Khilafah of uh, Hazrat Omar. Now, the story uh, so far that we uh, were recounting last time was up to the death, the assassination, the tragic martyrdom of, of Hazrat uh, Omar after an extraordinary meteoric career in which the Ummah has expanded over the horizons and the Byzantines and the Persians have been crushed and the local populations, particularly the oppressed religious minorities, have risen up in favor of the Muslim uh, conquests, and a completely new civilization is being born overnight. Extraordinary ages, uh, extra an extraordinary age of, of, of glory. That uh, Omar is stabbed in the mosque, but it takes him a few days before he dies, and in that time he wants to make sure that there is a smooth transition of power. He's against a kind of monarchical principle. He doesn't think it should be his son or somebody else's son or it shouldn't be done on the basis of genealogy. That's the old way, the Meccan pagan way. Uh, the idea that it should be a close relative is an older understanding and now it's um, whoever is most appropriate and, and the most uh, equipped and generally popular uh, figure should take over. But he doesn't designate one himself. Instead, what he does is to appoint a kind of electoral committee. He names six men and says, you've got three days, and on the fourth day you have to announce the new Khalifa. And he puts this in place before he dies. And the six men are uh, Ali, Othman, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, uh, Abdurrahman ibn uh, Auf, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas and Az Zubair ibn al Awwam, who are all major Sahaba, and selected very carefully so that the different shades of opinion, Ansar, uh, Muhajirin, all have people that they can identify with. So they're given these three days, uh, and in order to move things along, these are six friends basically, they all have the same purpose, which is to ensure that the extraordinary ascendancy of Islam shall continue and that the unity of the Muslims is maintained. Uh, and to demonstrate the quality of these people, if you compare it, say, to modern presidential uh, elections where everybody is backstabbing and gossiping and there's hostile advertising against the other candidates and it's, it's pretty miserable. These six men are different. So Abdurrahman uh, bin Auf says, I'm going to withdraw my own candidacy. I'm not in the running. But what I want to do is preside over the proceedings uh, and be a kind of chair of the committee. Lest be ladi una fisukum ala had al amr. I'm not, he's really saying, I'm not worthy enough to compete with you in this business. So he presides and he asks each of them in turn, starting with the, the, the five, who do you think should be the ruler? Uh, Ali, out of his own humility uh, and his haber, his as it were, awe of the immensity of this task, will not commit himself. 
Uh, Zubair says, either Ali or Uthman, I think. And Uthman says, Ali. And Sa'ad says, Uthman. So there's kind of a majority in favor of Uthman. But uh, then Abd Rahman goes out and consults the generality of Muslims in the mosque. And generally he finds that they tend to incline to Uthman, who had this particular spiritual closeness to the Holy Prophet So on the morning of the fourth day, Abd Rahman goes out to the mosque and he prays Fajr. فَلَمَّا صَلُّوا الصُّبْحَ اجْتَمَعُوا وَأَرْسَلَ عَبْدُ الرَّحْمَانِ إِلَى مَنْ حَضَرَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ So after they prayed Fajr, the, a crowd started to collect and Abd rahman sent off messengers to the key people of the Muhajirin and the Ansar. وَأُمَرَ uh, الْأَجْنَادِ ثُمَّ خَاطَبَهُمْ And also to the leaders of the, the army. And then he gave a khutbah, then he spoke to them. فَحَمِدَ اللَّهَ وَأَثْنَى عَلَيْهِ ثُمَّ قَالْ and he praised Allah and glorified him. And then he said, Amma ba'd, fa'inni nazartu fi amri nasi wa shawartuhum. To proceed. I've looked carefully into the affair of the people and I have consulted them. Falam ajidhum ya'adiluna bi Uthman. And I've not found uh, anybody who really uh, disagrees with Uthman. That's the preponderant view. Thumma qal, and then he said, Ya Uthman. And then he says, O oh, Uthman, we pledge allegiance to you according to the Sunnah of Allah's Messenger. And the two Khalifas after him. So he's the first to pledge allegiance. And Uthman says, Naam, yes. And then the Muhajirun make uh, their pledge of allegiance to him. And the Ansar pledge their allegiance to him. And the leaders of the army pledge their allegiance to him. Well, Muslimon and the generality of the Muslims. And that was at the beginning of the month of, of Muharram, this is year 24 after the Hijrah, uh, a few days uh, after, three days after the um, uh, burial of Omar. It soon becomes clear to everybody that this is going to be a different experience, a different kind of ruler. Omar is always walking around with his stick. He's absolutely determined, not only that there will be moral excellence and probity uh, in his city and in his nation that he's just created, um, uh, but uh, he's determined that uh, the inward flourishing of the Ummah will, will continue. Sayyidina Uthman is the same, but his is more, not the puritanical, but more the aristocratic, um, noble approach. And he's also quite a bit older. He's in his 60s already by the time he takes over. Uh, and he's this noble, physically beautiful, um, beautifully eloquent and well-spoken um, individual who now finds himself in the hot seat presiding over the most significant political enterprise that the world has seen probably since I don't know, the founding of the Roman Empire or even Alexander the Great. This, these are days of destiny. Uh, but he accepts the responsibility despite the fact that he himself is still sleeping in the mosque and getting dusty and he's not interested in the dunya side of the pomp and circumstance. He just wants to secure the unity and the greatness of Allah's uh, people. So his policies are significant, and generally his reign is uh, one of expansion and consolidation. The conquests continue unabated. They're more difficult now because the frontiers are so far away. It takes a long time to get a message from the frontiers of China to Medina. A long time, but still he's managing these very different distant campaign. So the army is going to Central Asia and it's in his time that Yazdegerd III, the last uh, of the emperors of uh, Persia, is killed by one of his own people as he's fleeing from the, the liberating armies. Uh, and he sends an army also further to the west, beyond Egypt, through what's now Libya to Tunisia, to the neighborhood of what becomes the great Muslim city of, of Qairawan. Uh, and if you look at the uh, emergence of the fiqh in early Islam, you find that Qairawan is one of the centers that very quickly develops, one of the most humane and intelligent of the, the schools of early fiqh. It's not 
uh, ideologically committed to some kind of philosophical architecture for its folk. It's closely rooted in the practice of the people of Medina. And but for the founding of this great city of Qairawan, um, the subsequent history of the Sharia would have been very different. Uh, so this army is cutting like a knife through butter to the territories um, to the west under Uthman's foster brother, um, Abdullah bin Sa'd. Another amazing thing that he does without hesitation is that um, his relative, Muawiyah uh, ibn Abi Sufyan, who's been appointed to be the governor of Syria, says the Byzantines are constantly attacking us from the sea. And indeed, they invade Egypt. They try and recapture uh, Alexandria and they're rebuffed. So Muawiyah says, we need a navy. We've been great on land. Let's try our fortunes on the, the waves. And so... Uh, with the characteristic foresight and uh, innovativeness of these people, Othman says, fine, and they create shipyards in Syria and in Egypt. And they create a navy that, even though the Muslims have hardly been to sea before, uh, Arabia is you know, a few boats going around the coast, but the Red Sea and the Gulf are not the same as the Mediterranean at all. They start to win battles by sea. Uh, in part, it's because most of the sailors are actually willing local volunteers who uh, sick of the Byzantines. Most of the sailors in the early Muslim naval conquests are actually Christians. They're Copts or they're Jacobites, Christian minorities who have been very happy to um, see the back of the Byzantines and to accept Muslim rule. So now the Muslims are safe from Byzantine incursions by sea and they're able to invade Cyprus. It's in the time of Sayyidina Othman that the Muslims uh, invade uh, Cyprus. Uh, Ghaza Muawiyah al-Bahar, ma'ahu Ubadi ibn al-Samit, wa mra'atuhu um Haram. So Muawiyah uh, invades the sea, as the historians say, and with him was Ubadi ibn al-Samit, one of the great hadith narrators amongst the Sahaba, a very saintly man, who's of course buried next to the Haram in, in Jerusalem. And with him was his wife, Um Haram. Um Haram, important. She's old at this time. She had been one of the wet nurses of the Holy Prophet wasallam. but these are feisty women, she's not going to hold back, she's really old, but she gets on a ship, Muslims haven't really been on ships in the Mediterranean before, she wants to see this conquest of, of Cyprus, and she actually dies uh, during the siege of Larnaca, and she's buried there, and you can visit her tomb and her mosque to this day, which is a great Muslim site in the island of Cyprus, they call it Hala Sultan Tekesi, it's a beautiful place, and everybody should should visit. So the witness of the Holy Prophet lives into this era of conquest and she's buried in, in Cyprus, in it's the European Union now, isn't it? So the European Union is honoured by having uh, the Sahaba within it. Um, and until the 20th century, when the Ottoman ships or any sh ship flying a Muslim flag went past that part of the Cypriot coastline, uh, because the, the the grave and the mosque are on the coast, they would lower their flags to half-mast out of respect for her. And if they had a cannon in the days of um, naval cannon, they would fire a salute out of respect for the wet nurse of the Holy Prophet. Anha. Unfortunately, um, because of the rise of anti-Muslim sentiment in, uh, in Greece uh, just two years ago, the, the tomb and the mosque were quite badly damaged by vandals, uh, blocked up graffiti and so forth. Uh, so something the Muslims ought to be doing to, to look after these places. In any case, so the Muslims are now um, a naval power, and they capture not only Cyprus, but the island of Rhodes. The Byzantines, trying to get their balance in the face of this new threat, counterattack, and uh, they're defeated by Muawiyah at one of the great naval battles of world history, that of Sawari, it's called the, the Battle of the Masts because there were so many masts and the ships that were close to each other. This is before gunpowder, so to fight uh, at sea, you had to close with the enemy and board them. Uh, and the masts would lock, and you could have people up in the, the rigging, uh, attacking and climbing. It was an extraordinary kind of three-dimensional form of warfare. And the Muslims win hands down in this battle, which is off the coast of what's today uh, Turkey. And that's probably the largest sea battle the Mediterranean has seen for centuries. Uh, and there won't be another one on the same scale for at least 500 years. And again, the Muslims are victorious. So uh, Muawiyah, great conqueror, not only is victorious by sea, but he also conquers Armenia 
again with a good deal of support from the local Christians who don't like Byzantine rule. And he also had something that could have been one of history's great turning points. In the year 32, he besieges Constantinople, Istanbul. He takes his army through Malatya, right through what's now Turkey, and he crosses the Bosphorus, and he camps on the European side with many of the Sahaba, including Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, who of course is buried there, but there's other Sahaba also buried outside the city walls of Constantinople, and spends a year besieging the city. Now, of course, history is in Allah's hands. We know that what happened was what was going to happen. But it's permissible to think, because they had the expectation that there was the possibility of victory, what would have happened if Constantinople had fallen then, rather than in 1453? That's 700 years of Byzantine history that happened subsequently. Beyond Constantinople, there was nothing in Europe. And again, the Sahaba would just have continued until they'd come here, presumably, to uh, Cambridge and beyond. Constantinople was the only a fortress that stood in their way. But they couldn't deal with the city walls. They didn't have gunpowder, it wasn't around at the time, and they didn't know how to penetrate the city walls, and the city was being uh, reinforced in various ways, uh, particularly by sea. Many other things Sayyidina Othman does. He changes the seaport of Mecca. Now we assume it's always been Jeddah, that's where you get off your ship if you're coming to do the Hajj uh, by sea. But it was Othman actually who founded the city of, of Jeddah, and he kind of went there to survey the site. And it seems that he swam in the sea there. And so this is a, a blessed, these, these are blessed waters. He made sure the Sahaba were properly dressed as they went into to the sea. But um, uh, the old seaport for Mecca, Shu'aiba, was subsequently abandoned. And Jeddah turned out to be a very good site for a port. So all kinds of new innovative things. Even though he's, by this time he's into his 70s, He's still thinking outside the box. Another amazing thing he does is that he looks outside the frontiers of his empire to the people who are beyond, and he wants them to engage with Islam. So he sends an embassy to Sri Lanka, a kind of semi-legendary distant place, but he sends the Sahaba to Sri Lanka to call the people there to Islam. Uh, and he also sends an embassy under Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, remember one of the great conquerors at the time of, of, of Omar, to China. Now that was really a distance. And it seems that they went by sea around India and then presumably Indochina, Vietnam, Thailand, the Sahaba went all the way around to the ports of, uh, of, of, of coastal China and then inland to see the Tang Emperor. And they appeared before him and they told him of the emergence of the Sage of the West, the great prophet of, of Arabia, and summoned him to Islam. Now, the Chinese normally, uh, historically, they've not been terribly interested in or impressed by neighboring countries. They're not really influenced by anybody. They're convinced that they have everything that they need. This continued to be the case when the British were forcing them to buy Bengali opium in the, the 19th century. The emperor said, we don't need it. Our country has everything that we need. We don't need anything from you Europeans. But the Sahaba are bringing Islam. And although the emperor doesn't accept Islam, and again, that could have been one of history's great turning points had he taken Islam. And some Chinese Muslims say actually he was a secret Muslim, Wallahu A'lam. But still, he has respect for them, and he says, you may spread your religion here freely, and you may worship here freely, and he um, helps them to create China's first mosque. So Chinese Islam is really old. It goes back to the time of the Sahaba, the time of, of Sayyidina Uthman and the mosque of Sayyidina Uthman. And the tomb of the son of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas is one of the tombs of the Sahaba that are verified that are in China. So again, you can see the amazing mindset of these people. We tend to think Marco Polo was this amazing guy who went from Venice all the way to China. And that was the beginning of uh, a new age of looking beyond Europe. But for the Sahaba, that was just normal. You sent people anywhere, and they trusted in Allah, and they called people to Islam, and new um, horizons were opened. Uh, he does another thing. He strikes the first Muslim coinage. Uh, his reign is a time of economic consolidation and prosperity. One of the things that happens in these countries following the Muslim conquests, and historians can map this fairly accurately, 
is that trade routes start to be revived very strongly until you have the extraordinary network, the golden web of medieval Islamic commerce that characterized medieval Islam and made merchants so much a part of, of the Ummah. One of the reasons why that was possible is that the old Iron Curtain between the Byzantine world and uh, the Mediterranean world on the one hand and the Persian world and the Indian world and Central Asia and China on the other hand which have been there really since um, after, shortly after the, the collapse of the empire of Alexander the Great. The Romans had tried to invade Persia but they never succeeded. The Persians had tried to invade Greece at the time of Darius and Xerxes but they never successfully done it. <coughs> that was an iron curtain roughly along the valley of the Euphrates but the Muslims kicked open that door and all of these were now united in a single country which really was a kind of kiss of life for trade. And so people are starting to move east and west, and the Great Silk Road is one of the consequences of, of these early conquests. Because now you could go from one country, you'd be in one country, if you went from Tunis all the way to the gates of China. That had never happened before in human history. Alexander's conquests had been a kind of one-off meteoric phenomenon that hardly outlived his death. But the conquest of the Sahaba, those countries are Muslims, Muslim to this day. So commerce is reviving very fast. A lot of mosques are being built. Thousands and thousands of mosques are commissioned during the time of, of Uthman. The haram in Mecca and Medina are expanded. Similarly, we find uh, that uh, there are economic uh, transformations taking place in terms of things like uh, the use of um, uh, irrigation systems. We already saw how Sayyidina Uthman dug a kind of predecessor of the Suez Canal, although from the area of Fustat across to the Red Sea. These are people who are interested in developing the world's infrastructure. They're not just into prayer and akhirah, they're developing the prosperity of the world as well. So one of the things uh, Hazrat Osman does is uh, to create a Muslim coinage in the Persian provinces, first of all. And they look like Persian coins, just so that the people will be able to recognize them. Uh, they even have the picture of the emperor, Yazdegerd, on them. Osman doesn't mind particularly. Uh, and it's only later in the time of the uh, Umayyad Caliph Abdul Malik that the Muslims have their first fully, as it were, Quranic non-pictorial dirhams and dinars. One of his most characteristic policies is his policy over Allah's book. And I mentioned earlier how important Allah's book is to this uh, soft-hearted Khalifa. He receives a delegation led by Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, one of the great Sahaba, who is saying to him, some of these Arabian tribes who've gone out to these far different provinces are making mistakes in their recitation of the Qur'an. Sometimes their memories are jumbled, sometimes they get the vowels wrong. These are dialects, they have bad memories. There's a danger that the text's unity will be lost. And so one of the greatest things that he does uh, in his caliphate is to save Allah's book. Abu Bakr in close consultation with Zayd bin Thabit, who had been Katib al-Wahi, the scribe of the revelation in the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had created the first Mus'haf, a basic text which ended up being conserved in the house of um, uh, Hafsa, radiallahu anha. This copy is brought to Uthman, and again the great Sahaba are assembled. Zayd bin Thabit is kind of the, the head of this redaction committee. They make sure that the text that they have physically is absolutely the text that everybody in Medina remembers from the time that um, the Prophet himself is leading the community, particularly in the Tarawih prayers. <coughs> and then the Caliph has four or five copies of this made, checked and checked and checked again, and sent out to the great uh, provinces, and he orders that anything that differs from these texts should be destroyed. And interestingly, you can still see fragments of the distorted text in some places today. In a, a, a little cupboard attached to the great mosque in Sana'a in Yemen, for instance, they found a few years ago <coughs> some ancient parchments that preserve some of the distorted readings. It seems that instead of being thrown away, these were just put in a cupboard. They thought it would be disrespectful to throw them out. And you can still see that there were indeed pretty minor differences. In the early period, there was a certain instability creeping in. When Osman launches this blessed enterprise of unifying the memory of the community on the basis of the, the, the memory of the Qur'an of the first Sahaba, those variants stop and no longer are a problem. And so all of the sects of the Muslims today, alhamdulillah, are united in a single Mus'haf 
a single uh, text. And that really is his work. And you can see, um, if you go today to uh, a great place, which is the Moy Mubarak Madrasa in uh, Tashkent, in, in uh, Uzbekistan, you can see one of these uh, copies of the Qur'an, which is preserved in a great perspex case. Uh, it's a tremendous place. Everybody should go there. It's near the Mufti's office in Tashkent. Uh, and um, there's the tomb of Abu Bakr al-Qaffal, which is there, and a, a madrasa. And they've kept one of these uh, mushafs there, which is certainly worth uh, checking out. <coughs> so it's a, it's a time of glory, but it's also a time of pain. And uh, Muslims are always disconsolate and confused when they consider the events leading up to what we call the first civil war, although it wasn't really a civil war, but rather a kind of civil disobedience that got out of hand. It wasn't huge armies clashing and thousands and thousands of people being killed. It was a few hot-headed rebels uh, and a caliph who couldn't bring himself to punish them or to fight back. That, I think, is one helpful way of looking at it. Imagine the, the scenario, you have this huge empire with these vast distances, the choice of governors in the provinces is going to be really important because they have to take decisions on their own. Um, part of Othman's greatness is that he believes radically in Muslim equality. He thinks that whoever is the best man for the job and will get the work done is the person who should be appointed. It doesn't matter who he's related to. Very often the people who are from the old Meccan elite are good at administering, it's in their blood, they've been doing it for a long time. He's not going to discriminate against them. And we've already seen how he appoints Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan radiallahu an, to be the governor of Syria and Muawiyah is this guy who conquers Armenia and conquers Cyprus and conquers Rhodes and wins the battle of the masts and he turns out to be a brilliant provincial governor. So, uh, in, and in some cases, he dismisses people who are from the old Meccan elite, and this uh, generates resentment as well. So, Amr ibn al-As, the conqueror of Egypt, he um, withdraws him as governor of Egypt. Uh, Amr becomes a critic of Othman, but what's not going on here is a kind of clear power play between possible contenders to the Khalifa. It's not really clear to anybody who the obvious alternative to Othman would be. There are people grumbling, as there always are, uh, politics is politics, human nature is human nature. There are people who are discontented, people who think things could be done differently, people who think the conquest could be even faster, the prosperity could be greater, different sorts of people, their own relatives might be appointed. This is human nature. None of these people are infallible after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. And we find people's uh, loyalties are often quite flexible. So although Amr in Egypt is kind of critical of Othman, Amr is not necessarily siding with Ali instead, because at the arbitration of Safin, when Ali and Muawiyah, uh, ten years later, are contending, Amr is actually representing Muawiyah and not representing Ali. So it's not a kind of Othman versus Ali uh, uh, trade-off. It's, it's much more fluid and complex than that. And of course, Ali and Othman are uh, personally very close to each other. Othman's problem really is that unlike Omar, he was mild and he didn't sack people unless he had to uh, and he really was reluctant to punish people, even people who were really uh, rioting or people who were rebels. Um, he, he was very mild. So there were these grumblings that he heard that were unclear from different provinces. So he called a council. Um, of all 12 governors. He brought in all of these people who were ruling on his behalf in these far-flung corners of his empire, and he brought them, sat them in front of him in Medina to identify what is the problem. Uh, and he also sends some of the great Sahaba, people that everybody respected, to the great provincial capitals to try and hear what the word was, what was the buzz on the streets, what are people saying about the way things are. So he sends Osama bin Zaid great Sahabi to Basra, Abdullah bin Omar, great Sahabi to Syria and so forth. And they come back and they say basically things are fine. Of course, human nature is human nature. Some people are chattering, complaining, would like things to be otherwise, but basically uh, things are well. So Othman then, because he's a soft-hearted person, wants to get to the bottom of this, he invites everybody who might have a complaint to come to the Hajj. So they can do the obligation of the Hajj, but they can also meet the Khalifa and discuss their issues. 
But when the people come, they seem to be reluctant to mention their issues, partly because it's the Hajj, partly because the great Sahaba are there, and they're kind of, they realize that their complaints are kind of silly, inappropriate, personal, <coughs> not relevant. And so he doesn't really get to hear um, what these people are saying because they've realized that the Sahaba are against them. But some of these grumblers in this huge new empire start to acquire power and the rebels effectively are taking over <coughs> in Egypt and in Basra and in Kufa, in those three significant places. For start, and the two garrison cities of Iraq, Basra and Kufa. <coughs> um, and a thousand rebels come to Medina. Othman is very reluctant to be the one who starts some kind of fighting between Muslims themselves. This has not happened. And he cannot bear to do it. And so when uh, a ragtag bunch of a thousand or so people come from Egypt to Medina to sort him out, to try and express whatever it is that's upsetting them, uh, he doesn't send an army out to um, thrash them, which may well be what Sayyidina Omar would have done. Uh, instead, he lets them into the city of, of Medina and he watches to see what they're going to do. And they go to Ali and they said, we'd rather you were the caliph. But he says, no, Ali remains loyal to the man whom the Muslims have made bay'ah to. So they think, all right, we'll try a Zubair, we'll try a Talha. And they all say, no, we are loyal to the Khalifa. And so then they go to Othman's house. Uh, and by this time, people are saying, you have to stop these people who are in the city and rioting. Uh, but Othman has a tremendous sense of the horma, the sanctity of the Prophet's city. He will not shed blood in the city of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He knows this is the city that will be safe from Dajjal even. This is the city in which Imam Malik radiallahu an is going to be walking barefoot in the city out of respect for the Prophet who is buried there. This is a city of so many blessings. The city that, as the hadith says, rejects ugliness <coughs> the way that... Uh, Iron, when it's heated, rejects impurities. So it's his, his piety and his respect for, firstly, the right of Muslims to express their opinions, and also for the sanctity of the city of Medina, that in a sense is the reason for his downfall. The population also, out of respect for the city, feel likewise. They really don't want to see fighting in the streets. His own servants in his house and a certain number of local people ask for permission to fight against the rebels, but he refuses. And then the Hajj happens and the great Sahaba from the city of Medina leave on the Hajj. Uh, and then uh, things start getting more unpleasant because the rebels are stopping him from going to the mosque. It's not quite clear what they want and they're not united amongst themselves. Uh, but he can't go to the mosque, and then they surround his house and forbid any supplies of food or water into his house. <coughs> but they can't get in because the house is guarded by some of the great ones, particularly from the Ahl al-Bayt. Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein, no less, are there on either side of his door to stop these um, people from getting in. number of small skirmishes, and Al-Hassan is actually wounded at, at, at one point. <coughs> Othman goes up onto the roof to try and talk to them. Again, diffident. He's, by this time he's old. Um, well, he was in his 60s when he becomes Khalifa, and this is 16 uh, years later, uh, 12 years later, and he speaks to them. Sa'id Uthman on Yawman ala satr Uthman went up onto his roof. فَسَمِعَ بَعْضَ النَّاسِ يَقُولُ And he heard somebody in the crowd saying, إِبْتَغَوْا إِلَى قَتْلِهِ سَبِيلًا Find some way of killing him. And he said, by Allah, neither Allah nor his messenger have made it lawful to kill me. So he's not, he's not doing it as a personal sort of self-defense. Why should you kill me? He's saying, this is not lawful. Neither Allah nor his messenger have made it permissible. سَمِعْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ يَقُولُ I heard Allah's messenger saying, لَا يَحِلُّ دَمُّ رَمْرَئٍ مُسْلِمٍ إِلَّا بِإِحْتَى ثَلَاثٍ the blood of a Muslim is only lawful on three occasions. Kufran ba'd Islam, aw zina ba'd ihsan, aw qatlu nafsin bi nafs. Kufr after Islam, or zina after being in a state of ihsan, somebody's been married, aw qatlu nafsin bi nafs. Or 
um, murder. That's a Bukhari hadith. So again, it's not him against them. It's him presenting the law, Allah's religion. This is the fiqh, this is a sound hadith. In Sahih Bukhari, uh, you, why should you kill me? I haven't committed any of these three offenses. وَمَا فَعَلْتُ مِنْ ذَلِكَ شَيْئًا I haven't done any of those things. ثُمَّ قَالْ لَا أَخْلِفُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فِي أُمَّتِهِ بِإِحْرَاقِ مِحْجَمٍ مِنْ دَمٍ حَتَّى أَلْقَى I shall never be the successor of Allah's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم over his ummah as somebody who sheds a single drop of Muslim blood until I go on to meet the Holy Prophet. I simply will not do it. Not one drop. And he says, what do you want? And they said, resign, so we're going to choose somebody else. We will choose whoever we want. They don't say who. He says, I will not take off a garment which Allah has caused me to wear. He says, if you kill me, then never again will all the Muslims love each other. And if you kill me, then afterwards never again will the Muslims fight an enemy together. Those are his two predictions. And he's looking not for himself. He's not saying, don't kill me. He's saying, looking for the interests of the Muslims. If you do it, never again will the Muslims be united in love. If you do it, never again will be they be united against an enemy. So think about it. There's a lot at stake. The rebels are not listening and they start shooting arrows. And this is when Al-Hassan is, is wounded. And then, well, Hassan and Hussein are at the front. Some of the uh, Egyptian rebels find a way to climb over the wall at the back of the house and they break into his, his private rooms. So they go in, they burst in and Uthman is there and he's reading the Quran and his wife um, is with him. When that's all folk has said, the people were on the roof. Uh, and then this obscure individual, Sudan ibn Ramad, attacks him takes his sword and attacks him, even though he's sitting there, attacks him with his sword. And his wife, Naila, throws herself between the attacker and the Khalifa. He pays no attention and she loses her fingers as a result of the hacking that's going on. Uthman is killed. And then when they've done it, they just run away. And this is the end of the siege of his house after 49 Days. Naila, wounded, goes out to tell people to give the news. And when the people went in, the Sahaba went in, they saw Uthman was killed and they kind of burst into tears. And the news then reaches Ali and Talha and Zubayr. And they almost lost their minds at the, the, the tragedy, the terrible news uh, that they had heard. وقال علي أن علي said كيف قتل أمير المؤمنين وأنتم على الباب he says to Hassan and Hussein how can the Amir al-Mu'minin be killed when you were at the at the gate قال لم نعلم they said we didn't know they were at the front the assassins came in through the back and then the Sahaba pursue the rebels and most of them are killed three days later Hazrat Osman رضي الله عن is buried after his خلافة of twelve years and because he's, he dies as a martyr, as a shaheed, there's no ghusl. He's just uh, buried in his uh, bloody garments. So that's the climacteric end. And it's, it's difficult to imagine at such a huge distance, historically, culturally, what exactly was in the minds of those people on that terrible day. Uh, but we can... We, what we know is that Uthman radiallahu an was expecting shahada, he was expecting martyrdom because uh, he'd heard this from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself on a number of occasions. For instance, the famous hadith, he's standing on the mountain of Thabir, he used to like walking in the hills with his companions, Mount Thabir is just outside Mecca. One of his miracles was that uh, he was on Thabir and making a du'a 
and because of the powerful power of the spiritual tajelli, the mazhar, the, the spiritual magnetism of the moment, the mountain starts to move slightly. There's a minor earthquake and the pebbles start rattling down. And the Holy Prophet stamps his foot and says, Askin Fabir, be still Fabir, Fama Aleika illa Nabiyon wa Siddiqun wa Shahidan. Be still Fabir. There's nobody standing on you except a prophet and a Siddiq and two martyrs. And from that, of course, Sayyidina Uthman anticipates what's going to happen. It's happened to Omar. He would have been expecting something similar. This is a particularly tragic way for him to go. But alhamdulillah, none of the big Sahaba are implicated. These are relatively unknown people from um, recent convert backgrounds, in many cases from Egypt, from uh, Iraq, from elsewhere. So that is the case. But to the end, his policy was not to shed blood in the city of the Holy Prophet, not to be the one who starts it, who starts the bloodshed amongst the Muslims. They should be the ones who take the initiative, even if he's the first one who has to die in this strife. He prefers to be the one who is killed rather than the one who is starting the process of, of, of killing amongst the Muslims. That seems to have been the decision that he took. So the old man sitting there in a dignified way with his mushaf being hacked to death by these um, by these rebels. That's the way he wanted to go, and there's a nobility in that. Say may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have uh, mercy upon the, the great uh, the great Khalifa, one of the greatest of the rulers of human history, Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu an wa arda, and accept him and his actions and his intentions and increase us in love for him. And there is so much to be learnt from his seerah, from his life. And one of the things that in our democratical age, in which we're cynical about everything and don't speak much about nobility, one of the things that we don't see is this idea of human dignity and nobility, the aristocratic type, who doesn't care about his wealth, about his palace, about status and prestige, the one who really follows the principle of noblesse oblige, who does what he thinks is right for the people around him, uh, and forgets himself. And this is the principle that carried him through these 12 amazing years in which economically the Muslim world is thriving <coughs> and the frontiers are being pushed out. And Islam is reaching China, Sri Lanka. The Muslims are in Europe, in Cyprus, in Istanbul and elsewhere. SubhanAllah, so much is happening. A tremendous ruler, tremendously successful right to the end. And the way in which he goes or almost chooses to go is again through this principle of being noble and dignified uh, to the last breath that he took. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him and increase us in love for him and inshallah grant us all love for all of the Sahaba without exception. Barakallahu fikum wal afu minkum wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.